everybody, and welcome to everybody's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases with Coach Jimmy Phil and Jerry. I'm David Friedman. I want to thank you for coming along this journey with us. How are we doing today, Coach? Doing good today, Dave. How about you? I am fantastic. Uh, just a uh, little, little for Klemp of the summer winding down here, Labor Day weekend as we record this. And, uh, you know, it's been a good summer, but it was a little, little rough weather-wise, I think, and uh, didn't get quite as much outside stuff done as I was hoping. Yeah, I think it rained almost every weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was tough. It was a little tough this year, but um, still good summer, good stuff, a lot of stuff to uh, reflect positively about, and uh, looking forward to the fresh new fall year. What do you got coming up uh, baseball-wise? Um, we're just getting ready for our fall season. So right after Labor Day is when we usually start that, and we'll go into our practices I believe we do three, maybe four tournaments this fall, um, but usually it's a six-week process. We wrap it up the middle of October. Okay. All right. Great. Great. So for this week's show, uh, we took it on, again, another little bit of a different angle, uh, following up on our highly successful show that we had with Steven Springer last time. And we can't thank you guys enough. We had such a great showing, such a great outpouring of uh, listening and commenting. And uh, we're really, really thankful for that. Steven obviously is all aces and he's got a, he's got a big following. And hopefully we can turn that into, uh, you know, expanding our audience even more. Hopefully you guys really enjoyed that. I know that I did. And uh, this week, we will uh, have another special guest gentleman. His name is Anthony Pla. He's a coach of Division II Lincoln University, which is uh, just outside of Philly. And Jimmy, why don't you tell us, uh, how did you and he hook up? Well, we've been following each other on Twitter for a number of years. I'm not quite sure how many, but I took a shot and sent him an instant message and asked him if he would come on. Um, and the reason why I, I reached out to him was this past convention, which was a virtual convention for the ABCA, he gave a presentation on practice planning. And after watching his video or his presentation, I should say, I was impressed. So I said, you know what, let's reach out, see if we can get him on, talk a little bit about some practice planning. Yeah, and I think what you guys will, will see, what you'll hear as with this uh, conversation goes along, is uh, it, it's really, it, it's vital to have a plan. You know, it's, it's kind of the old uh, failure plan is a plan to fail type of thing. He stresses that throughout. It's something you and I have talked about, certainly over the months that we've been doing this show, but it's great to hear it from somebody who has uh, a pretty high level of success. Uh, again, he's been coaching for about 20 years now, so obviously he's, he's got it down, but it's interesting to hear some of the, some of the things that he talks about that he's learned through the years and the way he's made adjustments, which is again, something that you and I talk about constantly is that we're never done learning, right? Exactly. The impressive thing about the conversation was for the first 11 and a half years of him being a head coach, he was by himself. That really interests me because most youth coaches or a lot of youth coaches are by themselves. And I thought it would be pretty interesting to hear from a high level coach how he did it by himself so that maybe we can pick and choose a little bit of information from him to see how we could run our practices more efficiently. So without further ado, uh, here's the conversation with Coach Anthony Pla. So today we have Anthony Pla, the head coach from Lincoln University, on with us. How you doing, Coach? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How about yourself, Jim? Uh, no complaints here. My season just ended and yours is just starting, right? Yeah, we just got, we're just getting started with our fall baseball season. Uh, we just got started this week. Uh, pretty excited about the, the group of guys that we have coming in. We got a lot of young guys, a lot of young talent. Um, so we're pretty excited to get going right now. Nice. So what kind of things do you do to get going in the fall? So a lot of what we try to do for our, for our program is we try to essentially work backwards from day one, which is, which is our first game, which is this year's going to be February 15th. So 
What we try to do is work backwards from February 15th, what we want to have by then. And every day, week and month prior to that, try to install everything and get it as perfected as we can before we get into our first game. Um, and, you know, during the fall, we play a couple of scrimmage games against some outside competition. So that's when we kind of clean up some things. But where we are right now, the first couple of weeks of, of, you know, fall baseball is we do a lot of individual work and kind of get all the, the new players that are part of the program, get them used to and acclimated to what we're, our expectations are and kind of what used to how we coach and how we go about our processes and you know, any everything from defense, offense, pitching, base running, you know, batting practice, cutoffs, relays, uh, uh, you know, first and thirds, bunk cover, all of those things. We go over that in a lot of detail starting now through the beginning of fall baseball, which starts September 17th. Then we got about a 45 day window of fall baseball where we can have them for 20 hours a week, like we do in, like we would in the spring. And then once November comes and we go back to our individual work and we kind of fine tune what we did in the fall. And when we come back in the springtime, it's just kind of get ready for February 15th. So um, we're really just trying right now to, you know, see what we have coming in, uh, see how everybody progressed from, you know, May through the summertime and just essentially just put install what we want to have in our program but from culture to, you know, our, our signs and everything in between. And I think, you know, with a lot, we have a really a, a, a good group of young players right now. We have 24 freshmen and sophomores out in, our, in our program. So we have a lot of youth and, and a lot of it is so a lot of teaching is going on, you know, with COVID, you know, remember last year, we didn't have a big fall last year. We only had a few guys on campus. So realistically, this is our first fall season since 2019. Um, so yeah. this is this is this is really important for us, for for a lot of uh, programs out there. So we're just going to really kind of go back to basic stuff for us in our program, um, because the juniors and seniors are the only ones that really have been a part of anything. So we're just going to kind of take it slow, not try to go too fast, even, especially in the weight room, um, get guys acclimated to doing everything all over again. So. Just taking it day by day right now, not 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 trying to put too much on their plate all at one time. So when you say you work backwards, explain that. Like, what do you mean by work backwards? Yeah, for me, I think it's super important to understand, like, you know, when 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 we try to build a practice plan in our program, like you, you go back, you go backwards from the first game, because if you just try to throw stuff at these kids, there's no rhyme or reason for it. So we try to create a rhyme or reason. So in the fall is when you do your, for us and here in college, you do your, your team defense, your, you install your systems, what your program culture is. You know, as we do all that for a couple of months, then we get into our winter, we really focus on player development and individual skill instruction. And then when the springtime comes, we get into our season, we get into our game prep, we're at our pitch counts, you know, and we start to re- get into some repetition because now we should be kind of fine tuned. But I think understanding where we want to be in, February, I think that's where for us, we kind of start our entire like plan. So we, we want to, if we want to have our pitchers at 85 pitches by February 15th, and we want to have our relievers around the 50 pitch mark, and we want to have all of our plays, everything installed. When do, when do we do all those things? So each week of our fall semester is based around putting, installing all of those things. Obviously you have to do the the basics, your base running, your throwing programs, you know, what do you do pre-practice or pre-game with your infield defense, with your outfield defense, with your catchers? So all of these things are being installed right now. All of our pre-practice stuff and our and our throwing programs and 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 our warm-up programs are being installed right now. We'll do that and kind of get those right over the next 12 to 14 days. Once our, our fall baseball starts in September, now we have all of those done. We don't have to worry about those anymore. Those will be now done before practice starts. Now we can just get to practice. And whatever it is that we're working on that specific day is what we're trying to figure out for, you know, let's just say, and, and I'm just throwing something out there. You know, week one, we're going to work on bunt coverages with run around, run around first base. Week two is bunt coverages with run around first, runners on first and second. Week three is first and third coverages. Uh, week four is cuts and relays. And we'll install all of those things a little bit at a time. But that entire week is solely based on that one thing. And that I'm just throwing one way to do it. There's so many ways to, to figure this out. But I think having an idea and a plan and putting that in place instead of just going out there and saying, all right, today we're going to do cuts and relays out of nowhere. The kids are going to be like, well, what, what, why are we doing this now? So we have a plan in place to get to where we want to get to. And each week while we're going over all of these things, we try to put we try to have a, a, a whether it's an inner squad or a mini scrimmage based around those that specific thing. So every 
like so for example take the first one the runners on first base bunt coverage situation every pitcher is going to throw to runner on first base in bunt situation every single defensive player is going to be out there in the same situation and every hitter is going to have to bunt so we get all three aspects base running hitting and 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 defense all taken care of along with pitch counts um, so it's, if there's if this their bullpen day and we've got you know four or five guys that have to throw bullpens that day, they're going to throw their first part of their bullpen with runners on base and then go finish the rest in the pen. And I think it's important to understand the why, because if you throw everything all at once, you try to go all these team defenses all at once. The kids aren't going to remember everything. If you do it every day for four or five day period, now the kids are going to remember it throughout the whole time. And then that will stick with them. And then you go back to the first and second. And then when you do your inner squad in week two, now you have runners on first and runners on first and second. And then when you go into week three, you have runners on first, runners on first and second, and runners on first and third when you do your first and third defense, so on down the line. So this year we have very similar program that we're doing right now, but I think at the end of the day, the plan is to make sure that what we do is we have everybody understanding what our team defense is from start to finish, and we add all the other things with our batting practice, and we have like four or five different ones, our base running techniques and what we're trying to accomplish because – We'd like to, you know, again, and what your personality of, of you as a coach is and who you have on your team can dictate how your practice is going to go. Because a lot of people think, well, I'm a small ball guy, but my team really can't do small ball. They're, I got more power guys on my team. Well, then maybe you're not a small ball team this year or in this season just because. Um, but if you're, you know, very uh, a specific kind of coach, you're going to also recruit that kind of a player. So when we have all of our guys that are coming in, you know, all these guys we know can bunt and run because that's the kind of game that we want to play. And obviously we have some guys that can bang it around the ballpark. So we'll fit those guys into the lineup the right way. But all of these things get taken care of from literally the end of August till February 15th. And then once February 15th comes, I'll be honest with you, Jimmy, like I don't want to coach that point. I want to play the game and just fine tune when we get there, you know, we'll watch sure. video. We'll watch video. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was, I was just agreeing with you. I'm the same way. Once we get, you know, playing games, yeah, I, I don't want to. The only thing I want to be doing in practice then is what whatever I take away from a game that I felt like we didn't do correctly. Then when we practice, you know, before our next game, we're going to work on that. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, that's kind of what what the the thought process is for us at, at at Lincoln is to make sure that we give all these guys all the knowledge that they need the way that we want to see our program go and have our culture, because everyone's going to be a little bit different. There There might be some guys that really do fast paced defensive stuff. In the very beginning of our fall, we're very slow paced with the way we do things. We work on you know, our hands and our feet and making sure we have good transfers and we get to our routes are right to the ball. We have good paths. We get in the right lanes. We catch the ball the proper way. Like we really fine tune that stuff. And then as we progress through the fall, now we can let the guys get into their own little character and their own personality and play the game the way that they play it, along with all the knowledge they have from us. Now they become this unbelievable player over the course of their time. And you see that progression quite a bit, especially when they when we have them as a freshman all the way to becoming a senior. So they have their game that they came in with, plus the knowledge that we give them mechanically and fundamentally. Now they just blossom as a player. You hope. And I mean, that's the hope, obviously. And not everybody's going to do that. But, right. you know, I, I think a lot of the guys that come through our program, you see at the end, by the time they're a senior, you know, they're a, a complete player. Something that uh, that really impressed me is that now you just finished your 12th season, correct? No, finished my 13th season. You finished your 13th. Okay. So for, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, 11 or 12 years, you were just by yourself. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So 12 and a half years for 12 and a half years at while, while I've been at Lincoln, I've been the only coach. I've had a so, couple of volunteers. I've had a couple of volunteers, you know, here or there that have been able to help me do some things and, and help me with practice and help me with, with whatever we needed, but never full-time guy, never guy that's there on a regular basis. So it's really just been me for 12 and a half years. So this is what's interesting to me because I've pretty much been in that same boat that I very rarely do I have an assistant coach. Last summer, I actually had my son as my assistant coach who was with me the whole time, which was a rarity for me. But what what really impressed me with you is, as I know, it's hard enough for me to coach by myself. I can't imagine what it's like for you. So, you know, to the youth coaches that are out there, you know, from high school down, tell them, how did you run practices by yourself? Well, it was very difficult honestly, to start off with. You know, when I first got the program, I, I came from a program that had six coaches in, in college. So obviously, our pro, our our my, my previous institution, we were able to have a very efficient practice and get a lot of stuff done in, in a short amount of time because we had plenty of guys to go around, go through all the dis different disciplines in the game. 
Um, when I took this job over in, in October of 2008, um, obviously I was by myself. So running a, a two, two and a half hour practice, three hour practice by myself, by myself, it took a lot out of me because we were only able to do one thing at a time. And I, it's just me, my only set of eyes. I'm the only one hitting fungos. I'm the only one throwing batting practice. So it was hard to, you know, really just pay attention a lot to what we did. So the first thing that I did was it took me about two or three years to get into this, but I, I decided to change my practices quite a bit. And I, I could be on a, on an Island by myself on this, but it, it's worked for me. And, you know, after talking to a lot of youth, youth guys, it's really helped them out as well. So what I did was I created this, this practice plan where my day is going to be super long, but my players won't have that long of a day. So I, I ended up calling it the beast. I gave it a name. We call it the beast. And essentially it's, and you can work it however you want. The guy, I'll have a group come in first. Let's just say it's the outfielders today. So today's Thursday. Outfielders, you guys are going to come in first. And we're going to do 45 minutes of defensive stuff just with the outfielders. Nobody else is there. Okay. So they go into the training room. They get warmed up. They come outside. They do their their, their J-bands, their throwing program. Everything's done. And we start, let's just say it's 3.30. So we have 45 minutes. So at 4.15, our practice is now done. Now, during that time, I have the infielders, the catchers, and the pitchers all doing their warm getting ready to come out to the field. At three at four fifteen, now I have the outfielders, the infielders, the catchers, and the pitchers all at the same time. So the bolt the, the pitchers now do their throwing program stuff while the infielders, outfielders, and catchers go through a hitting progression. And we'll do that for about anywhere between 50 minutes to an hour, where it depends on what we're doing, that well, whatever we're working on that day. Let's just say we're in the cages that day. Um, we'll have six or seven stations of 50 minutes to an hour. We're going through them all, six to eight minutes a station. Now I get my eyes on every single hitter throughout that entire hour doing different station work. We videotape a lot. Now we videotape a lot of stuff. When I initially did this, I did not. So, so now that's the, the second part of practice. Once that part of practice is now over, the outfielders are now done with practice. They've had their two, two and a half hours of practice. They're gone. They go home. So now I have the infielders, the catchers, and the pitchers. Whoever has to throw a bullpen that day now goes to the bullpen. The catchers and pitchers go in the bullpen together. They throw their bullpens. Video cameras are on them because my eyes are on the defense now. And I have the infielders. So I have the entire infielders for about a 45 minute period. And I work with that, with the infielders. Once the infielders are done with that, they now have hit probably done some base running. And now we're doing our infield defense. Now they're done. They've been there for two hours. So they go, they leave the catchers. They've now hit, they've caught their bullpens. The pitchers now will go do their running and I'll take the catchers and do my 30 to 45 minutes with them on just defensive stuff. So that's the beast in a nutshell. And that's, that's me there for three, three and a half hours, but the guys are only there for two, two and a half hours, and they're all there at one point together, so you still get a team chemistry kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I've gotten everything that I wanted to get done in my practice time completed, but I've gotten it done where I'm not overwhelmed with having the entire group there at one time, only getting one thing done at a time. I, I exp- expanded myself a little bit, but I've made my practice more efficient. Right. So basically what it comes down to is breaking things down into – smaller function, so to speak, and making sure that you're organized and making sure that you have a plan. The um, travel organization I'm with occasionally will do a USA community clinic, which is teaching other coaches, youth coaches, how to coach. And the part of it that I do is practice planning. So I actually have a sheet that I use where I'll lay everything out from, you know, the minute we get to practice, you know, we'll do our running, we'll do our stretching, we'll do our catch play. And then I'll break everything down into time, you know, the amount of time that we're going to be doing that particular drill or that function. And, you know, to your point, to stay organized, that's how you do it. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to be honest with you, when I when I did this presentation at the, at the ABCA, I think this was, you know, obviously a key point for me. You know, the first point is there's not one way to do this. That's the first point that you have to make, you know, know what you have out there, know what know what you're working with and have a plan. Right. What's the end goal? I like I said earlier, work backwards. What's the focus of your practice? How much time are you spending on your practice and on on each different thing? Um, what do you have available to you? A lot of people don't have a lot of things available to them. They might not have a field. Maybe they're working in a gym. Maybe they're working in a in a parking lot. It, there's a lot of people different, doing different things, and I get it because I grew up in New York City, so I understand that there's not a lot of space sometimes because just there's some, there's a, a soccer group using the facility or there's a football group using the facility. So I get it. But I think to your point, you know, being organized is the second part of this. And I think that's extremely important because you want to make sure, number one, your players know what you're doing. You're on time with what you're doing. And some guys are okay with going over. Like if you have a list of stuff on your practice plan 
you know, and you only had 10 minutes for this slot, but you wanted to take 15 or 20. Cool. That's fine. Something else can take a back seat. That's okay. If this is super important that day, I have no problem with that. And, and I, I think coaches, yeah, I, I think coaches need to realize that there's certain things that maybe your your maybe your team's moving really well today, and you love the energy that's happening. Man, stay on that for a little bit. Let them feel let them feel the same kind of energy, or vice versa. Maybe they're having a bad day, and you need to do it a little bit more because you need the repetitions at it to get them better at something. I, I, there's no problem with that. But as long as you have a plan in place, I think that's it's important for your team because. You being organized makes them makes them be a little bit more organized themselves from top to bottom. We post our practice. We send our practice to our guys for the week and we post our practice in three different places. My office, the locker room and the field. So they know exactly what's going to happen at what time, what we need. The BP cage needs to come out. We need the hitting mats. We need the screens in these places. We need the we need the the, the portable mounds or the, the pitching machine. Like They know where everything has to go before it even starts. So we're, you know, at 3.30, we start. Boom. Here we are. You know, at three, at, you know, at four fifteen, we're moving stuff around. We know, all right, phase two, here we go. This is what's coming next. So the guys get to move, and this is what we're installing now. So the so the new guys understand, like this is how we're this is how we're moving at each moment in time. But being prepared, coach is is it's got to be at a super high priority for each one of the youth coaches out there because when you're organized, especially with travel programs. Your team, your players will stay with your organization a whole lot longer if your organization and your program are organized. If you're not, they'll be leaving and going to another program in, in one in one season. Exactly. I, I agree with that 100 percent. Yeah. You know, teaching young coaches and, you know, especially coaches at the travel. Work. Like I, I know that you had uh, <laughs> you had coached uh, with the Connecticut Blue Jays. Yeah. Um, so, so you've been in the travel world, but from what I remember about the Connecticut Blue Jays, a lot of their coaches were college coaches. Am I wrong? We played them one time and I believe I played against the, the coach from Purchase College. Yeah. So interesting, interestingly enough, you know, that, that program is near and dear to my heart. Um, one of my really good buddies, one of my really good college friends, well, I'm sorry, two of them, uh, Pat Hall and Kevin Huber created that program as, as their senior project in college um, okay. when they were seniors and I, and I was a freshman. And uh, they created the, this organization. And uh, when we all graduated, we all kind of geared towards them. Obviously, we were really, really tight. And we all started coaching. So the whole the whole program was coached by former college players. And we ended up all being college coaches, all of us. And, um, you know, again, a lot of organization, a lot of, you know, we took we took what we did in college and brought it with us. And Adam Taraska, who's the head coach of Purchase College, is a, is a good friend of mine. And uh, he was actually my throwing partner for three years of college. Know him really well. Um, and he coached one of the teams and we had guys that when I started coaching at University of Bridgeport, where we all came, where we all went to school, I brought some guys with me after their careers were over and they started coaching in our program. So we, we, we had a lot of good guys in our program that kind of helped build that organization. So that, that kind of proves my point that when you or or actually, you know, what, what you were just saying, when you have a travel organization, if you can have that caliber of coach or coaches that just know how to stay organized, I mean, the Connecticut Blue Jays is a very successful organization. So there you have it. It's it go. It always falls back to the coaches, and and my opinion is it, it falls back to the way they run their practices and how well they prepare their kids. I agree. I mean, being being prepared is is a hundred percent of what you have to be as a coach. I mean, you have to be prepared for for as much as you possibly can. And baseball, we as we know, is a very interesting game because you will definitely walk onto a baseball field. I don't care how many years you've been around the game, but you're going to walk onto a baseball field every day and see something you've never seen happen before. And as much as you can prepare your teams for those kinds of things to happen, for example, not many times nowadays do you see a squeeze play happen with a runner on third base, um, you know, at any point in the game. It doesn't happen a lot anymore, but there's a lot of travel organizations because of the coaching style. They like to do that and it catches everybody off guard. And if you're not prepared for it, you're not going to be able to, to defend it. Same thing with, you know, delayed steals and first and thirds and all. Like if you if you're not doing those things and 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 preparing in each practice, it's not going to happen. But I think. There's a lot of things that I think are important in practice planning, but you have to execute what your objectives are. If you have objectives with your, in your program, you have to execute them. You have to do them on a regular basis so your, your guys know how important they are to the program and, and you being successful. One thing I will say, and this is just from my experience, is that like you were just mentioning, you know, working on, on defending the squeeze play, believe it or not, we, we are still so far back in how do I explain this? 
we're starting at the very bottom when we're teaching most of these kids that we get in our programs. And when I when I say that, I mean we're involved in teaching them how to take leads off first base because a lot. I'll be honest with you, I get the kids at 14, 15 years old, um, they don't know how to take a lead off first base. So I have to get that right before I can work on stuff such as suicide defenses and stuff like that. What I guess what I'm getting at, it, it's the very rudimentary stuff that we're teaching and we have to hammer home and drill home. We're still working on catch play. When I get kids, a lot of them don't understand that when, you know, pregame, I think you use the word primers prior to starting your practice when they're going yep. through their primers. <laughs> they think that they're just throwing the ball just to get their own moves. And they don't understand that it's a drill, that we're learning how to catch, we're learning how to stay connected, we're learning how to transfer. So it's very difficult. What I'm getting at is, is at the travel level, sometimes, depending on the, the organization you're with, it could be very difficult to teach advanced stuff. We have to start very basic. Yeah, and, and it's a great point that you're making because, you know, there's there's quite a few times in my career, including this year, because we're so young, um, we actually have to take the time to go over this very similar things. I think the, the the worst part of individuals coming from high school to college is base running. I think it's it's not taught a whole lot at the at the younger levels. There's just not a lot of development at the younger levels. You're playing so much that there's not a lot of practicing and, and, and teaching and developing because guys right now almost and, and I don't want to speak for every travel program, but guys either can base run or they can't base run. And a lot of guys that that, that can't base run. They might have another tool. They might be a really good defender, or they might have a really good arm, or they might be able to swing the bat real well. But base running wise, they're they're not very good. It's it's not you don't find the, the total package in a player that that can do a lot of things well a lot. Um, there there's few and far between just because there's not a lot of development at the younger levels, which can be easily remedied if you take 10 to 15 minutes in the beginning or end of practice to go over it regularly. And I think it's important to understand that because we we base run every day. When we have a full team practice, we are base running every single day for a certain amount of time, whether it's before, during, or after practice, we're doing it because you're going over a lot of stuff during batting practice. We have base running during, you know, uh, rundowns, base running during cutoffs and relays, base running. Um, when we have obviously inner squads, we're base running or at the end of practice we're, for conditioning, we're doing base running and we're teaching the whole time. You'd be surprised how many guys don't know how to slide both ways, feet first and head first. You'd be surprised at how many guys don't understand but they have to, you know, they're on the on deck circle and they got to go run out to home plate until they got to slide or stand up or inside or outside. Like you'd be surprised at how many people can't do that or don't or were never taught it. They can swing it, they can glove it. But base running is, I mean, I can have a whole conversation about base running, but um, you know, if it's part of it, it's, again, if it's something that you that you are passionate about or that's something, it's obviously a part of the game. You have to teach it. If you don't teach it and develop it, then it's not going to get better. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. Base running is something that, and I, I, you know, I'm guilty of it. I don't spend a lot of time on it. I do spend, I'll say, a decent amount, but not what I should. And I take the blame for it. Just w with my high school team this past uh, spring, I had a runner on second base, a deep fly ball hit almost to the fence to deep right field. And he's standing there looking at it. He, You know, he just never went back to tag up and he didn't advance. He should have known, but then I looked at myself and I said, well, wait a minute. I never, I never went over it with him, but here's a 16 year old kid that doesn't know you should be taking up baseball IQ, you know, is something that if you do these things when they're younger, as they come up, yeah, the baseball IQ is obviously going to get better. But for, for some reason, I'm seeing that that's not happening. Yeah. I, I think the best teacher is what happens in a game because you can take what happened in a game and then bring it back to your practice. And this is what we talked about earlier about, you know, when the season comes, I want to go over stuff that we didn't do very well in the next practice. You know, we're not just going to go out there and take fungos and hit BP. We're going to work on things still because we want to stay fresh for the next series. You know, for whatever, you know, our next series, you know, we know this team likes to steal a lot. So we got to make sure our pitchers are, are have good feet. Um, and we didn't do a good job the weekend before. So now we really have to work on it a lot or, or this team likes to bunt a lot or, or whatever the case may be. This is a, this is a team that, that has a very ver versatile lineup. That's righty, lefty, righty, lefty. You know, we got to make sure we understand our shifts and when we're going to when we're going to move. We don't shift a whole lot, but we got to make sure that we're on pull side and, and do the right thing with the outfielders and the infielders. So there's again, baseball is the kind of game where there's so many different aspects. And there's nine positions that have nine different things to do. Um, the pitchers are out there not just trying to throw strikes all day. They're, they're, they got to they got to they have to pitch. They got to play defense and they got to pick off. 
uh, runners and hold runners. So there's just, you know, and then hitting, forget about it again, you know, could be on these podcasts for hours, just talking about one aspect of hitting, you know, hitting the ball, or the opposite field or whatever the case may be. So, but if you have the opportunity from a game to take a teaching teachable moment and make, work that into your practice plan, you can change it up a little bit. It, it can be whatever you want, but let the guys understand guys, because we did this last week, this is the situation. This is what we're going to do. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll end this part of it with saying this almost every game now in travel baseball is videoed by somebody. Somebody has a clip somehow, some way of that specific play that we had, get that video or videotape it yourself as the coach and make sure you go back to it. So you can show it to the guys. Listen, these, these phones are, are, are unbelievable and, and they can do a lot of things. Send them a, a YouTube link, send them a, just a real quick, a real quick video and say, guys, do you remember this play? We're going to go over this play and why it didn't go so well or why it went really well in our next practice, just so we all understand this is where you're you're building baseball IQ. So you all understand how and why this went well or didn't go well. That's pretty interesting because the, uh, I guess it's the game changer app that most people use, you know, to keep, um, keep the book. You can actually send the video of the game through that app, through that game changer app. So one of my parents this summer, I believe he recorded or at least sent if if he sent it through the app, I'm sure that there's a recording of it. So he probably has a recording of, of every single game. So that's pretty interesting what you said, because I can get that. And that's a great teaching tool. I mean, I, I also umpire as well in the summertime and, and obviously going on recruiting trips, you go, you go to all these different tournaments, all, all these different places. And they have these, 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 um, the GoPros. I mean, I went to a game once where there were seven different GoPros behind home plate from seven different parents that set them up. And like, so there's a, there's how many different angles you're going to get with those things. There, there's a video nowadays on, on, on everything, but I would highly suggest that, that coaches, if they can figure out a way to do it um, with their phones, with a GoPro, with a regular video camera, just set it up and and videotape your practice, videotape the games, videotape at bats and pitchers, and not just for recruiting, but for development. All, all we all we ever get is videos of people that are that are that are being rec- that we're recruiting, obviously, and they're sending us their videos of whatever it is they're doing. But at the end of the day, there's you can learn so much from that and, and help develop these young these young kids to be better baseball players overall, not just in, in certain aspects. Like and and then at the same time, now it helps your entire team because like you know Johnny was playing you know in the five six holes a shortstop the entire tournament, and meanwhile he let like four or five balls go to his glove side that he just missed had he only been one step or two steps over to his left to his glove side he would have gotten there no problem and now you have a video of it hey johnny this look at where you're standing you're, you're really far over in the five six hole why don't you slide over two steps you can get to that five six hole or or you know jimmy's gonna take you know he, he's he's over no, far enough over as a third baseman that he can cover that you don't have to be all the way over there so just little stuff like that i mean anything that could really help yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I know that I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I'm definitely going to um, encourage it. I mean, I, I guarantee that I'd be able to find, you know, a parent because each year the team changes that'll be willing to videotape the game, and that's that's fantastic. Be able to, yeah. you know, in every organization, everybody, everybody has a, you know, they cost a little bit of money anyway. I think it's like two fifty, three hundred bucks somewhere around it to, to get a GoPro. But if you invest in a GoPro. And you have it ready for each game, or or let's just say you play a double header, you get ice one of those games, you have enough to go by. You know, you have enough to go by. And you can buy one of those little spider things. I don't know what they're called, but they're spider something or other. Throw it on the fence, hit the play, hit the record button, and and Let go ahead and, and go back. Hey, in the fourth inning of this game, I remember. Let me go back to the fourth inning of this game and go back to this play. So in our next practice on Tuesday, we're gonna go over this. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, any, anything that's gonna help to make, make the players, you know, just better, just to develop the players is, is a big plus. So um, yeah, that's something that I'm definitely going to look into. I, I, um, yeah. I, I, I just hope that, you know, the, the everyone that gets the chance to listen to this podcast, I hope there's a, a lot, and I know it's going to be a lot of youth coaches, but at the end of the day, our, our jobs in, in the youth world is to help develop them to get to the next level. So that they're they're prepared for anything. So if it's if it's little league guys are getting ready for high school, if it's high school guys are getting ready for college, if it's the high school coaches are getting ready, getting them ready for either your next season or their summer their summer travel teams, and obviously you're getting ready, getting them ready for college. And as for us college guys, we're preparing them for life, obviously, but we're preparing them if they have the the, the abilities to go on to the next level, which is professional baseball. 
And we have to continue to develop them on a regular basis. And again, if if Johnny's really good at one thing, but he's not so good at this, when I have an opportunity to help him and develop him at the next thing, I got to take every opportunity to do that. Yeah, the, the the last article that I had published in Inside Pitch Magazine was actually on that subject, preparing players for the next level. And it basically talked about exactly what you just said, is that no matter where you are, there is a next level. If you start in Little League, you know, you have minors, majors, all-stars, you know, you're trying to climb that ladder. You're trying to make your freshman team and the JV team. And then, you know, guys like me that are trying to get players ready for guys like you, it's uh, always preparing them for the next level. And it's it's holistic too. It's obviously we're preparing. This is all about baseball, but it's holistic because you know if you if you have them enough, if you have a guy that comes in your program at 13 years old and you got him until he's 18, it's five years of development. And if he's the yeah. same guy at, thir- at 18 that he was at 13, only a little bit bigger and faster, then you didn't really do very much for the kid. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And but the the other thing too is to make people understand and be able to notice what development is. I think that. Parents don't take this the wrong way, but this is mostly, I think, the way parents look at it. They think that if little Johnny was batting 200 when he was 13 and then he comes to you at 14, well, by the end of the season, he should be batting 600. And that's development. You know, you're developing him because I could see it. And then, wow, what a great hitter. He is. They don't understand that development comes in very small increments. So if and I, I, I've used this example, you know, I get a player at 13 years old. And one of the things that he learns is, you know, how to how to hit cutoffs or how to be in the right place for a cutoff if he if, if he's an infielder or, like I said before, how to take the right lead off the first base, you know, base hit you're thinking two and how to hit the base and, and break down after, you know, after you make your turn. Those are de- those things are development and you are developing that player because he's not he knows a lot more, but it's not something that's tangible. It's not something that's really noticeable unless you have a trained eye and you're going to see that. I mean, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. So it's it's something that's very, very difficult to make parents understand is you may not see that he's hitting, but I'm I'm noticing he's barreling the ball up more and more than from when I first had him. You know, he's making solid contact. Those little things, you know, but the parent may look at his batting average, which, you know, like I said to you, we had Springer on and, you know, his big thing is batting average is a trap. And they'll look at his batting average and say, well, his batting average didn't go up. I'm like, no, but he, you know, he's hitting the ball harder. You know, um, everything is working. He is developing. So, again, it just has to come in small increments. Yeah, especially when they make the jump from 12 to 13, from the little field to the big field. You know, it's, it's you know, people think that it's going to happen overnight. You know, they're still learning how to how to get the ball across the diamond. They're still learning how to throw it that far. Um, they're still their eyes are adjusting. Uh, that's a big jump, and there there needs to be some kind of leeway. There there are guys that develop physically earlier than others, and and that's another factor as well. Um, and obviously, when you get to be eighteen years old, at eighteen, you can be a senior in high school, you can be a freshman in college. So you know that's two different levels of baseball at the same age. You know, and when you get to, and obviously when you get to college, everyone's on the same level playing field at that point. You can be an eighteen year old kid playing against twenty four year old. That's you know been in the game for a little while, and you got to go up there and produce. And you, and if you've been able to produce at every level, well, here's your next step. The only thing that changes in the game at every level is it just speeds up. And I think and I think something that we talk about when we when we when we deal with practice planning is if you understand that as a coach, then your pace of your practice needs to reflect the pace of the game. If you're at a 14 year old level, the pace of the game is not going to be unbelievably fast. So you can. You can slow it down just a little bit and then try to work them with a stopwatch or 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 timer, whatever the case may be, and work them to just get faster so that when they're done with your season, moving on to the next 15 year old level or, you know, JV program, now the game speeds up again. Again, you go to 16 and 17 the game speed up again. And obviously, when you're 18 years old, if you're not at the highest pace that you can play at 18 years old, then you're behind. And that's when, you know, guys that think they have a chance because they batted 500 in their junior year. Then they're only batting, you know, two two ninety in their senior year. There's a big drop off, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe maybe the game just got a little bit faster for them, and they they weren't prepared. They still hit two ninety, you know, and now it's just a different different kind of game. You know, it's the game speeds up, and and your your practice plan needs to be based upon that, especially when you make the jump from twelve to thirteen. Twelve to thirteen years old, like thirteen year old coaches need to realize that they're having guys that just played on the forty five the forty five sixty diamond or forty six sixty diamond. And 
Now you're developing arms. So you got to take you know, control their arms. Don't let them throw too much because now you're, you're and usually that jump happens from August to September. So they go from a little field in August to the big field in fall baseball. And like you're making these kids throw, you know, 80 pitches from a 60 foot mountain. Guys, slow it down. Yeah, you know, happen. make sure make sure you develop the players because that's when that's when guys get hurt at a young level and maybe they don't want to play because they're not having as much fun. You know, keep it obviously be organized and keep it fun, but know know what you're working on. You know, how do you keep control of it? I think is all these things are important, but how do you keep control of your practice, whether it's with a time, um, maybe it's by attempts, you know, you're doing it so that you, you can so you get it right or so you don't get it wrong. Um, and every coach is a little bit different, but I think pace of play needs to be part of that conversation. Um, do you want it to be game speed or do you want it to be a repetition type thing? We're not looking for, you know, a, a four second, four seconds off the bat. We're looking for 4.5 and smooth right now. And then in the next le- in the next practice, we're going to look at a 4.3. And, and move it down there. And then, and, you know, on Friday's practice, though, Friday, we're going to go game speed. We're going to go, we're going to go game like it needs to get over there in four seconds. That's how it has to happen. But the more you practice that way and challenge them and give them some challenges throughout the practice and make it competitive, you know, now you're really building on, on, in, in a program of culture of practice is just as important, if not more important than a game, because we have to try to get as, as right as we can. Got to remember a shortstop might only get five or six plays, and outfit might only get three or four fly balls, sometimes none at all. And you just have to be prepared for when that one t- when that when that time happens because there'll be a game when your left fielder who's your stud um, or your center fielder who's your stud gets zero fly balls for six innings and then in the, in the top of the seventh inning one run ball game he gets one ball hit to him and it's the last one of the game that he has to throw somebody out at home and he has to be as sharp as he possibly can so you know then we talk about your repetitions in between innings you know make sure those count those have to matter as well like so everything in, in baseball matters because at, at some point. Now you're not going to obviously lose the game on this one play, but this one play is super important. And that's what makes them all important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I know that that's what you just mentioned is something that I, I know as a coach I'm um, getting better at, but I used to struggle with is, you know, how to make practices more game-like, how to challenge kids at practice. You know, it's something that I'm working on now that like what you were just saying, I will time players from shortstop, you know, first base. I will, um, there's a lot of stuff that I'll do now where there's ball flying all over the place. So guys have to be on their toes, ready for anything. But again, it's, it's something that, you know, younger coaches and again, myself included, even though I'm not a young coach, but I'm coaching at the younger levels, you know, can be something that people will struggle with. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's really important to create some competition within your players in the organization. Well, we do it all the time and practice compete. Let there be a winner and a loser. So guys know how to win. Guys know how to lose. And they know how it feels to be on both sides of it. So it's not a surprise on the first day out there. Um, everyone's won. A lot. No one's ever gone undefeated in their entire season. And no one's ever really lost every single game in their entire career. So everyone knows how to do it. But as you create that culture in your program with competitions, whether it's, you know, a, a king, of the, king of the infield or king of the outfield, you know, I catch every single ball or I throw every ball into the screen the right way, whatever, whatever it is, you, you've got to make sure that you, you, give these guys some kind of competition in every one of your practices to keep it competitive and keep it fun. Cause guys always get into it a lot more and they, and they work a lot better when there's some kind of competition. So we talk to our guys about this all the time where we say, you know, compete against yourself, but obviously you're, you're competing against the guy behind you. So if, if I want to be the starting second baseman in my program and there's two or three guys behind me, well, I have to do better every day because they're going to be on my heels because they're all going to try and take this spot over. And that's a good, friendly competition. And it can get heated sometimes, but sometimes at our level, we're working with young adults, that's what's going to happen. And that's okay. And then, you know, there's a lot of curveballs that can be thrown your way. Then you have, you know, a whole other topic to get into, but inclement weather, no facilities, minimized space, not enough equipment. There's three or four teams that are at the facility at the same time. You know, you, again, one coach, two coaches, three coaches, whatever you have. If you're If you're a team that has four coaches regularly, and two guys don't show up. How do you run your practice? You know, your squad size. I, I talked with a coach from Texas over the summer or uh, during COVID last summer, um, and because he had asked me about my practice planning stuff, and and I, I mentioned this to him. So he has a, he has seventy guys in his program, and they all practice together. Wow! And they have a certain amount of time each week that they that they are allowed to have with the players. And I said, you know, then there's definitely like right away in my mind, I'm like, all right, well, there's definitely a way to break that down depending on how many coaches you have or what it is that you're working on. 
because not all 70 guys are going to be infielders. Not all 70 guys are going to be pitchers. So you know it's going to work around. You're going to, you're going to work around what you have positionally. And you can work out work at it where you have guys in the outfield, guys in the infield, guys in the cage, guys at home plate. You can work on a lot of different things, but you have to be organized when you do it so that all 70 players know what's going on the whole time. Because if you do have this practice where 70 guys show up, where you have your, your varsity team, your JV team, your freshman team, and your 7th and 8th graders are all there at the same time, the seventh and eighth graders are not going to be able to do what the varsity guys do, but they can still do the same drills and skills at their pace. So, you know, it, it rains or there's, you know, in our case, we have snow, rain and cold. Um, we don't have lights in our baseball field. So we're going to be inside sometimes. So how do you, how do you make that work with 35 man roster? So, and how do you do that? Well, you can split it up. You don't have to have everybody come all at the same time. You can split it up or you can have different corners of the gym doing something different. You can split it up. You can, just, I guess the best way to say it is to be creative. You know, our generation of, of, of players and coaches, we were, we're a lot more creative than the youth that are out there now because they have all these video games in their cell phones, not as creative as us and, and can make things. And there are some, and don't get me wrong, there are some kids that are like that. But I think we, as, as guys that have been in the game for a while, we can get creative with facilities, space, and whatever we have. You know, think about when all, all, the, all the big time D1 coaches and nothing against them or, or professional baseball programs. Um, talk about having practice. They've got five or six hack attacks and they've got, you know, four guys hitting fungos and they've got um, two guys on the field. Oh, that's awesome. And that's, and they make an efficient practice happen through that. And God knows all of us would love to have those kinds of things and the facilities and the different fields. And that's, that's fantastic. But then you go to a guy like we're talking about, you know, a, a youth coach, that's, you know, a volunteer that only gets four, four to six hours a week with his guys. you got to maximize what you can get out of that and get out of your players and still try to put a, put a product out in the field. So I just think that it's important to understand where you are, you know, do your research prior to that week of practice. You know, it's going to rain on Wednesday and we have practice from, from, from six to eight or from five to seven, whatever it is, but we're going to have to be either be inside or get on a turf field or something. Cool. Do that, do that beforehand, but have that plan regardless. We want to work on this specifically. We can still do this inside. We can still make this happen. And God, if Zoom taught us anything in the last two years, year and a half, two years, I mean, there's so many ways to skin a cat in this and and, and get your practices um, under control with some pace, have objectives and, and get to work. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it. There's so many great coaches out there that have so much, so much knowledge that I've stolen from, you know, I'm, I'm the, you know, one little piece of the puzzle in all this. And obviously I'm not the end all say all, and I'll never say that I will, because I'm going to learn for the rest of my life in this game. So I love it so much, but if you have an opportunity to, to, to get creative and, and kind of figure th- things out on your own, you can create something that's unbelievable and that other people are going to steal from you. Yeah. I'm with you on that. But something that you said that was pretty interesting too, is that like, I'll, I'll use this as, a, as an example. When I go to the convention, I'll go and I'll listen to different guys talk. And like you said, you know, these big D1 programs, some of these, you know, big heavy hitter coaches are out there and they're talking. And I know I can't run a practice, say, the way they do, but I can grab a little bit from this guy to, hey, wait a minute, I can do it. I can do it this way. And then I'll grab a little bit from him. You know, and and to your point, you know, that's how you develop your culture and your program by all of these little things. I can't do it, obviously, the way a D1 program can, but I can do it my way. And just yeah. take that knowledge from them. Absolutely. I mean, the way that I think about coaching is, you know, I am I'm a direct product of every single one of the coaches I've ever had in any sport I've ever played. Yeah. Throw my personality into it. And now I become this coach. Well, since I started coaching back in 2002, I've learned from so many different people than just the guys that I that I that were my coaches. Sure. That now I've become this very eclectic person in the game because there's so many ways to do it. And I still have my personality and the way that I like to play the game, you know, and as a player, I was a certain way. And as a coach, I'm, I'm kind of the same way, you know, for all intents and purposes, I'm, I'm more of a defensive minded coach. Cause that was what I loved the most of the game. And that's the kind of guy that I am. So I need to surround myself. If I do have volunteers or assistant coaches, like I do now, uh, coach Connor is amazing. He's our pitching guy and he's unbelievable. And he's, a head coach as well from the high school ranks that came up to college ranks. And he's been around the game for, you know, 15, 20 years, like, like myself. And, and, uh, but he's, I gave him the, 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 the pitching side of things. So I can take one thing off of my plate and I'll be honest, 12 and a half years by myself, it's really hard to let go of stuff because I've, it's always been mine. So, 
you know, now we're, we're trying to divvy some things up and, you know, he helps me out quite a bit. Now I'm not the only one throwing batting practice, the only one hitting fungos, the only one going over drill work. Um, but I've taken stuff from everybody. And obviously now coach Connor and I talk on a regular basis. So, so there's a lot of information that he gives my way and stuff that we learn from other places. And now he takes the knowledge that he's learned and gives it to me. And, you know, I can steal stuff from, from Corbin and, and from Monty Lee and from, and from all these Steve Springer, who's amazing and, 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 and Nate Trotsky and, and so on and so forth down the line. And, you know, Kai Correa, who's with the giants now, and you still Billy Boy was with the twins. And I've, I've, I've taken stuff from all these people and I'm creating this thing that I, that I love now because man, there's just so many cool things out there and man, social media has been great being able to see all these guys doing drill work. And you know what, hold on to topic and conversation, but these guys on social media that kill the guys that are going out there just trying to help the game and grow the game a little bit and being creative and being, you know, trying to make new things to help guys out. But it's just great to see some cool things out there. Maybe that doesn't work for me, but that works for him. That's fine. I just, exactly. I don't like that drill. And that's okay. okay. Uh, you know, I, I can, I can almost guarantee you in every sport out there, there's guys that do it this way that, that this guy doesn't. And, Absolutely. you know, help me understand it. You know, the whole thing with launch angle, I don't really understand it a whole heck of a lot, but I'm learning it and trying to get better at it and understand it. You know, obviously there's a lot of, a lot of pull now going towards all the, the, um, the statistics and the shifting and everything like that. And we don't have a lot of access to those kinds of things. So I'm learning it now and you get all this information and now how do you work it into your program? And again, you don't need all of it. You know, the new, the new toys that come out that we, that always come out every year, right? Somebody makes something new. You don't need it all, but if you learn it and it works for your program, your personality, your character, and what your program is all about, then you can use it and it helps you. And I think including yourself, everybody at the youth level, there's so many great youth coaches out there that I've stolen so much from um, because they've been successful with, and they really know what they're talking about. So, you know, have an open mind when you're going through this process and learning stuff, because you may not have 20 hours like I do or infinite amount of hours like major league baseball does. You may only have four to six hours a week, maximize that time and get as much as you can out of it. Right. Well, you know, it all comes down to, you know, even somebody like me that, it's a, it's not a full time thing for me, you know. So I don't have a lot of time. But whatever time I have, to your point, social media has been great in teaching me so many things in how to become a better coach. And you know, other youth coaches out there, a lot of times I feel like a a, a youth coach, maybe somebody that might have played at the high school level, maybe he played a little college ball, and he you know he volunteers, like you said, to go out there and and coach, and they believe that well, I played you know, in high school or I played, I know, I know, I know the game. Well, there's so much more to it. You know, you may know the game, the X's and O's and the nuts and bolts, but there's so much more to coaching than just, you know, being able to teach, you know, like, like you said before, like a, uh, a bunt defense or, you know, cutoffs. Yeah. You might know that, but something that I wanted, wanted to know the direction I wanted to go in. What about teaching the mental part of the game? No, oh, I was, was going to, I'm so glad you brought it up because that's huge. Yeah. Huge, and I think especially nowadays with all, all the stuff that's out there about the mental side of the game, I think it we do so much physical stuff um, on the field, so many physical aspects of the game. Obviously, because everything everything needs that much time, and we we sometimes forget about the mental side of things that I think is unbelievably important, if not the most important part of the game, because it will it can elevate a player's game exponentially on a daily basis if they work on it daily. And, you know, I, I've, I've befriended Alan Jager a few years back at one of the conventions back in Anaheim um, a few years ago. I think it was about five years ago, six years ago now. And you know, ever since then, I've had some chances to talk with him and, and his group of guys and, and the whole aspect of the mental game and installing it and talk with Coach Sheets down in Georgia Gwinnett, who's there now. And, and like, it's just, man, you really have to do it. And you really have to know what you're talking about to get that side of it to – to calm the stuff down in your head and, and really just kind of do it on a, on a, on a daily basis, regular basis, because it's so big guys that struggle at the plate that were really, that are really talented and really good. They don't understand that they just need a little bit of break. They just need a time, some time before, during or after they're at bat before practice, before a game, whatever it is to just decompress, let it all go and just kind of let your, let your, let your mind just kind of be free of things so that you can just get back to where you are. You know, sports psychologists are making a lot of money now because of this stuff. And I just think that if we can, at the youth levels, just install a little bit of it now so that they can get used to what it's supposed to feel like, this is the biggest topic now. And it's the hot topic right now, um, other than, you know, shifting and things like that. It's just a huge topic. And I think it's it has to be a part of your program. I, I think it should be daily. That's my opinion. It should be a daily thing. Um, I agree with but, 
but I think that if you're not going to do it daily, if you're not that big on it right now, at least once or twice a week in your practices or before games, you have to get it done just because it's so such a big part of the game now, such a big part. It, and it'll help guys get through a lot. Yeah, last year I started going to a mental performance guy and I would do Zoom meetings like this with him. And he taught me, the, you know, the purpose of it was for him to coach me how to teach my players. And, you know, I would go to him. I forgot how often we used to do it, but I mean, we stayed in touch. And anytime I need anything, I can go to him. But if you come and you watch my 14-year-old players, the first thing that they do is they will lay down, they will meditate, and they will do their box breathing before we get going, clear the head. There's other exercises that we do when they're in the batter's box. Um, you know, you got fooled on a breaking ball, take a step out, find a focal point, deep breath in, deep breath out, get back in. There are things that we do that I'm trying to get them prepared at 14 years old to move up. You know, there, um, there's this, I think that it's, that it's important because, like you said, there's going to be breaks in the game an error, uh, uh, a missed pitch, you know, uh, um, a, a pitcher on the mound that, that was was cruising through three and then the fourth inning, he just loses a little bit for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Like those learning to understand to slow the game down a little bit and get that focal point. Because I said earlier about how fast the game becomes. The guys that become elite baseball players are guys that are playing Major League Baseball or professional baseball across the world. I believe the reason why they're so good and can play at that elite level is because they understand how to – refocus when they're when they lose their focus and more importantly how to slow the game down enough listen it's fast enough that there's guys out there throwing 100 miles an hour on every game that you see now on major on, on tv and if you can't slow it down for yourself to make that ball look like it's not coming 100 miles an hour then you're not you're never going to see that pitch so you have to be able to slow the game down in every aspect to can get control of your breathing and your heart rate so that you can perform at a peak level because once you've raised your heart rate and your and your mind starts wandering all over the place it's it's you're not going to be very successful and you're going to lose it. I can't tell you how many times we've seen guys throw bats and helmets and and get upset at things at the youth level and even at the college level because it's not going their way. Last year we we, we played against a team. A pitcher came out of the game, walks to the dugout, punches the back wall of the dugout, and fractures his hand because he couldn't let it go. Like sometimes you're going to have bad days. You're going to go over four quite a bit in your life. You know you're going to, you're going to have a bad outing on the mound. You're going to whatever you're going to make a few errors in the game. It's going to happen. It's that's the way the game's played. No one's perfect in baseball. You can't be. It's impossible. So the, the sooner you can understand that part of it and the more that you can do the mental the mental practices that you do with yourself to get your focal points back and kind of control your breathing, it's it goes a long way. So I, I think, you know, to 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 go into this a little bit deeper, I, I really think it's important to understand that this that the mental side of the game needs to become a part of your practice, a regular part of your practice as often as possible so that guys can learn how to break it down for themselves. And it's not you as the coach consistently saying, you got to calm down, relax, because no one wants to hear that. You usually get more mad when you hear those kinds of things. Um, so if you can learn, learn that on your own, I think it's super important. And, you know, we, we, do, we, we take yoga, you know, we, we have this mental part before and after practice um, before games. And, you know, obviously in the course of the, over the course of the game, guys are in the at-bats, guys on the mound, guys on the field, you know, you got to take the, the, the breaks of the game, which is in between each pitch to get your focus back. Right. Yeah. And and like you had mentioned about failure, failure, especially again at the younger ages, uh, it's it's something that needs it, players need to be taught how to handle failure because they don't know how to do it. Like you said, they're pouting, they're throwing the bat, they're throwing their glove. So we actually do and I, I'm, I'm incorporating this more and more into my practice plans is we're actually having a failure station. So what I, and I, I stole this from another coach, that we actually have a protocol. So, you know, the shortstop uh, goes to field the ground ball, it goes through his legs and a run scores. There's a protocol where he has to say, okay, guys, uh, two outs, players at first, I'm back. And I want him to say, I'm back. And you'll actually hear me from the dugout yell out to the player, are you back? So that they learn that, okay, that's gone, it's over, we're back, new game. So, you know, again, at the, at the younger levels, I think it's very important to teach them because most kids have never been exposed to failure like they do in a baseball game. I agree. I agree. And I think it's important to remember that I said earlier, that's why you have to have the competition in, in practice so they can learn to have those, those, those moments much more often than, than just a game. So when you can have them practice the – 
failing, I guess, I, you know, when they make an error in, in, in your, in the competition, all right, well, here's your, here's your chance to get your focus back right here and just say, and like, as you said, say, I'm back. Um, this is your chance and opportunity right here. Here's your teaching point to get it done right now and take that, you know, we call it the USA moment, take the USA, or we call it flush it. The way that we, our, our mantra for our program is so what next one or so what next pitch. Um, so we, we tried to bad call by the umpire. That's, that's the best, probably the biggest one where, um, you know, listen, the grass is green, dirt's brown and umpires are bad on every field you play on. So all you have to do is realize that before the game starts and you can, that shouldn't ever bother you. No, that, right. let that be, that's my job to get mad at the umpire if he's inconsistent or whatever the case may be. So, but I think it's, I think you made a great point. I think it's important to to have these guys do it. I think it's a great idea to have a, a station at practice that if they do fail, that that's where they go and to, to let loose and then get back into the, in the swing of things. You know, some, listen, sometimes you need a little bit more than a minute. Sometimes you need a couple minutes to get, to get over it. It's, I get it, man. I understand the game. It's, it's not an easy game to play. It's based around failure. Um, it's, it's a, it's a pitching and defense kind of game. It's not a hitting game. Um, you know, three out of 10 and you're the best ever. Everybody gets that. And I just, you know, you have to give the guys an understanding and how it works because you're right, man, little kids. And I think the biggest thing for me is they don't understand it. They don't, they just don't want to let anybody down, which is why they take it, why, why they take it so hard. Um, and when you get to the college level, now you're adults and now you have, you know, this big, you don't want to lose your scholarship. You don't want to let your parents down. You don't want to let grandma and grandpa down. You don't want your teammates down, your coach down. And more importantly, you don't want to let yourself down. At the end of the day, I think the, being mentally tough and having mental parts of your practice keeps the game away from you. And now you're no longer selfish. And I think it takes the game and, and brings you back to the, to the level of it's we, not me. Let me get over this and be ready back to, from, so, for my team so we can be successful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think what, what you just said is is really, really important for, for youth players to understand that, yeah, th- that's the reason why they get so upset is because they feel like they let somebody down, but you didn't let anybody down. I mean, I, I, I tell my players all the time, believe me, I said it, I tell them, I've been around this game a long time. You're going to make errors. You're going to strike out. You're going to get fooled on a breaking ball. All of this stuff is going to happen. It's part of the game. Forget about it. And move on to the next pitch. There's always, each pitch to me is a game. Okay, so we're trying to win that game, and that's it. Once it's over, whatever happens, okay, we're on to the next game, which is the next pitch. And the 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 more they understand that, the better off they're going to be. Uh, Agreed, a million percent. Um, That's why that's why we have the mantra. So what next pitch? Which I kind of stole from a former player of mine who now coaches at the college level in, in the JUCO ranks. Um, he has a team. He has his team use the terminology "flush it," and he actually has a little toy toilet bowl that they bring on every game and have it in the, in the home dugout as well. That when a, a kid comes in and does something bad, he has to actually hit the toilet bowl flush, and it flushes, makes the sound of a toilet bowl flush. So that Love now, it. once once he does that, he needs to get over it. It needs to be done and over with. And I just think there's so many ways to do it, um, but I you really need to make sure that it's part of your practice. You know, regardless of all the other things that are happening, bad day at school trouble at home troubles with girlfriends whatever the case may be like a lot of things are going to get in the way and the 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 sooner you can get yourself out of it remember we all have a job to do trying to win this game or win this pitch then the the sooner you're going to be back at your peak performance that you can make things happen for us yeah yeah and you know during during a game you will very rarely hear me say anything from a dugout very rarely i keep my mouth shut i watch the game i let the boys do their thing but one thing that you will hear me say, and I'll say this a lot, is body language. And that's it. That's all I'll say. And my players know what it means is that your body language is bad. So, you know, I'll just yell out, hey, body language. You know, and then I'll say to them, are you back? That's pretty much all that ever comes. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's other things that I'll say from the dugout, but very little. But that I will. Yeah, that's it's, that's a that could be a detriment to a guy, like, especially if he has body language, you know, from a, co- from a college coach's perspective. <laughs> well, I'm probably I'm probably going to walk away from that guy, you know, if he has body bad, bad body language or he's a bad teammate, so on and so forth. But again, things that you can do in practice to help body language stuff is to is to, you know, come up with something in your program that if you're starting to feel or start to feel that you have bad body language or one of your teammates see that you have bad body language, you can step in and, and help that guy out. And this is part of this is part of competing in practice. This is part of why you work on it beforehand. This is all part of development. 
You know, this there, you know, I remember I remember Little League World Series back in 1992. You know, we had a really good program, really good team. We, we had this one guy in our program that was always like always fired up. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that there was a lot of pressure from his parents. The kid's 12 years old, but there's so much pressure. You know, when he did poorly or made a mistake, he'd lose his mind. And, and you know, unfortunately, that kid didn't last in the game much longer on a Little League World Series team. And, and you know, he is like a million other kids. There's so many guys out there that do that kind of stuff. And the guys that are able to get back to the game, get back to the we before me type mentality, those are the guys that, that can get to more of an elite part of the game, you know, move up from high school to college, college to play in professional baseball. Listen, you can play this game for as long as you want. You know, you don't want someone to tell you that you can't play anymore. You can play this game for as long as you want to play it. You just want to be the person that dictates when it's over. You don't want someone else to dictate because right. when it's over. And, and a lot of that, a lot of it, a lot of the people dictate it because of either bad performance, bad body language, or, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Rick Ankeel. Rick Ankeel was a was an unbelievable baseball player. He was a great pitcher, and then he just lost it. Yeah. Well, he, he couldn't figure it out in the mound, but you know what? He's like, I still want I still want to play this game for a long time. So he figured it out, put the bat back in his hand, went out to center field, was an all star. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, to to your point, I always tell my players what you were saying before about a college recruiter. If a college recruiter is, you know, there are recruiters at the game. That recruiter should not know if he just walks to the field. And just comes there, he should not know whether you're throwing a no-hitter or you just gave up a three-run bomb. He shouldn't know. Your body language should not be able to let him know what's going on. So, again, body language, yes, is very, very important. Absolutely. And definitely can be worked on um, regularly. And, you know, we, we talk about the team aspect of, you know, quite a bit. And there's something that I have installed uh, three, four years ago now um, was having a lot of a lot more individual meetings. And I think, you know, youth guys, travel guys, they don't have this opportunity quite a bit. But when you do have an opportunity to get one on one with a player, take that opportunity because it's important to them to understand that you still have faith in them, regardless of what the situation is. You know, we do a lot of one on ones with our guys, obviously different than college level, but they're on campus and everything like that. So we get to sit down, talk about everything, talk about life, talk about baseball, talk about everything that goes on, you know, moving on to the next levels in their careers, whatever the case may be. But I think those one-on-one -on -one moments that you have, those teachable moments that you can get a kid one-on-one -on -one before, during, or after a game or at practice, um, I think that's important. And when you can do it at practice, if you have the opportunity to do so, and more than likely it's going to be either before or after, it'll, it'll re reinforce what you're trying to inst instill in them. And, and that's just to kind of keep, keep a cool head, play the best you possibly can, work hard, and, and continue to, to you know, don't have bad body language, help your teammates. And, and then obviously the rest of the baseball will kind of take care of itself as you, as you move along. But I think this, this could be a part of your practices and your games to make those one-on-one -on -one conversations are unbelievably important, especially on impressionable young kids that are looking up to you as the coach to help them get to where they want to get to. And sometimes you can go through an entire season and barely have a conversation with a, with a kid, you know, more than just the game itself. You don't even know what the kid's goals are. So how can you develop the kid if you don't know what his goals are? Coach, I, just, I want to be the best high school player I can be, and then I'm done. I don't want to go play college ball. We assume, most coaches assume that each kid wants to go play college, but maybe that's not the case. Or maybe he does want to play college ball. Or maybe he wants to be good enough to go to, to get drafted by high school. Well, hey, man, you got to work a lot harder than this. There's a such thing as a weight room. Some kids don't know what that is. You know, they got to learn, they got to learn a lot of this stuff. And I just think those conversations are important. They can be done in practice as well. I just had that conversation with my sister, believe it or not. My my nephew, high school baseball player, he was an all-conference player this past year. And he doesn't want to go on and play in college. And my sister called me up and she said, you know, he doesn't want to go and play. You know, that I said, leave him alone. I said, if he doesn't want to go on anymore, finish out his high school career. And then I, I talked to him a little bit and he doesn't want to play in college. And that's fine. Be the best high school player you can be. And if that's what you want to do you want to end it after this this coming season? Then that's great. But to your point, yeah, you you if you don't know, I mean, like she was surprised. She didn't know that that he didn't want to play in college. It, nobody ever asked him. And again, I think that's why having those conversations are super important, especially for parents. You guys, you got to let if you're putting all this pressure on your kid and he doesn't want to play college baseball, 
Sometimes it's because you're putting all the pressure on him. He doesn't want to play college baseball. But if you're putting all this pressure on him and all he wants to do is be, you know, he wants to hang out with his buddies during high school and still and still have fun playing baseball, then back off a little bit. Let him enjoy it. Maybe he does want to eventually, you know, man, I had so much fun my last two years in junior year and senior year. I, I really want to play college baseball. Well, there you go, man. Listen, there's there's 1,560 something college baseball programs in the country. There's a place for everybody to play if they really want to. Absolutely. But if they're not if they're not having fun, if they're not learning and developing, then they're not going to get better. They're not going to get better, and they're, and they're not going to have a shot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm believe it or not, I'm still going to try to get him in front of a few recruiters to see, you know, see if there's any interest in him, and then let him make the decision. And that's what I told him. I said, "Look, you, you know, you, you don't know." I said, "Let's get you in front of a few recruiters, see what they say, and if there's some interest, you might change your mind. And if you don't, that's okay too." So, yeah, I mean, this has been great. You know, what, what advice do you have for? you know, youth baseball coaches up to the, the high school level, again, about their practices. If you could sum it up in, you know, a few quick sentences, what would you say? Um, I, I guess I would say make it yours. Whatever it is, whatever you're going to come up with, out of everything that we talked about tonight, I would say make it yours. Your style, your tempo, assess your, assess your, what your program is like. Be specific, be organized, teach, develop. Don't just expect these kids to learn to know everything and, and in fact go the other direction. You know, be be a, be a coach. Help the, help them learn something about the game. Um, but make it yours. You know, um, simply put, I think if I go through the whole thing, there's more than one way to have a practice. Have a plan. Be prepared. Be organized. Execute your objectives. What's the most important thing to you? Get it done. Create your plan, control your practice, and if problems come up, get creative. And and also make it fun. Got to have fun. Got to. You, know, you know, a lot of coaches will, will argue that point, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, you're, some guys will say, "Well, you only have fun when you win." Eh, that may be true, but your youth and your youth coaches and travel coaches, and and I think in order to keep the kids involved in the game, you want to try to keep it fun and still, regardless of of the final results, you know, and I think if you can continue to compete and practice and, and give them the mental side of it and just have conversations with the kids about everything, you know, things outside of baseball, it goes a long way. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I, I, I always, I always say nobody wants to win more than I do. Nobody does, but you know, we're going out there. We're trying to develop players. We're trying to make it fun. If, Believe me, we've played games against some powerhouse teams and lost, and I was so proud of my players. There's been other times where we played teams that were inferior that I thought were not as good, and we lost them. Those those are the, the times that I don't – that I'm not – I feel like I'm not develop, developing my players. Something went wrong there, right? But so the, the point that I'm trying to make is that the winning doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is how the team is performing. Well, I, I think to a certain extent, it it, do, it does matter in, in in certain aspects of it. But I think you're right in in that how the kid, the 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 person, and the, and the team are developing is 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 way more important, or it should be more important. Um, and I think at my the, level, yeah, yeah. And I think at the end of the day, if you can keep kids in your program, you're doing the right thing. If you can continue to develop guys and move them on to the next level, whatever level that may be, you're doing the right thing. You know. Also, remember that the game does change a little bit. Keep up with the times. Don't get stuck in a stone age. Even though there's a lot of guys that still still go old school. I'm an old school guy myself, but I've I've honestly I've understood that there's a lot of new school things out there that that need to be input there because these kids have been doing it for four, five, six years. So you got to make sure you're up with the times. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you're a volunteer guy that's only got four to six hours, give them four to six hours, whatever you got, give it to them because they, they, they want to, they want to be out there. And, and I think, I think you do too, if you're giving some of your time, your free time away to these kids. So enjoy the time when you're out there. We only get to do this for, for so long. We can only throw BP and hit fungos and teach for a, a, for a, a short amount of time. And I think if we can make it to the point where we're all enjoying our time out there, we're going to be doing this for a really long time. And I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. And, and we've, we haven't been the most successful college program in the country, but when I, when these kids walk across the stage, I'm a happy guy. Um, and we're going to continue to fight to try to win and get better players and, and build a program up to where we got to get to. And, 
And, um, you know, it's all because of people like yourself that are continuing to help grow the great, grow the game. So um, if any, if at all else, I appreciate you doing this and hopefully there's, some, there's coaches and parents and players that listen to this and want to ask questions. I'm, I'm, I'm more than available. Just, just get in contact with me somehow, some way. Um, but just like yourself, I want to help continue to grow the game and, and, and push this thing forward. So um, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for being here. I mean, this has been a great episode. There's a lot of stuff, you know, that we just talked about that people can take and learn from. And and again, like you said, grow the game. That's what it's all about. So I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think you're doing a great job. Everything I've seen about your program, it's been going in the right direction. So, you know, again, thank you for being here. I appreciate it, Coach. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Our interview with Anthony Pla, head coach at Lincoln University. So, Dave, what do you think? Well, uh, I think overall it was much improved than most of our conversations because uh, I wasn't in it. So uh, I think I think you did a great job there. Uh, so uh, just as a programming note, just due to a scheduling conflict, I just had a last minute thing. I wound up not being able to join in on the conversation. Uh, really wish that I had been there because he was he was a great guest, and uh, I will say I think you did a great job handling that without me. He. Um, you know, I'd be very interested, obviously, his background, uh, having played and coached at University of Bridgeport, which is my alma mater, where I had played. Um, looking, looks like I'm about 10 years ahead of, uh, ahead of him from when he started playing. So it would have been uh, interesting. And maybe we'll get him on again sometime down the line. I think that would be pretty cool, being that you both played your college baseball at the same school. Yeah, yeah, I'd be uh, be interested to talk to him about that because I had I've not really been back there, and I've heard that they made a lot of uh, a lot of improvements to the field and the facilities and whatnot. So definitely would be would be cool to hear that. But uh, as far as the conversation itself goes, very very interesting stuff. You know, it's always great to hear other perspectives as we talk about. You know, we we have to be open to learning and hearing new ideas from other people. Sure. One of the things that really interests me about it is I love hearing from higher level coaches what they need us to do to prepare our players for them. Yeah, you know, we we can again, it's one of those things where if you're not looking for that type of feedback, then you're you're not only flying blind, but you could certainly be going a direction. Maybe you could be going in directions that don't need to go or be could be detrimental to our players as far as their long-term development. Um, and it's the type of thing, uh, again, because I know you and your methodologies, I know that you're not doing this, but there's certainly been many, many cases that we've both seen through the years where coaches are uh, burning players out just to get that win, you know, to win that game or that tournament or that season. And, uh, you know, what are we doing to these kids long-term? You know my philosophy. It's all about developing players. And just as long as we have those goals that and, and it's one of the things that Anthony and I talked about during the during the show was how to get the players ready for the next level. And whatever that level may be, I'm always looking because I'm 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 a travel coach and I'm a high school coach. I'm always looking to get my players to that next level, which is varsity high school baseball, first of all, and then on to college. So it's great to hear from them what they're looking for, what's missing, what we can do better so that we can get uh, players prepared for them. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that was fantastic. I think he offered a lot of good insights into that and the, the practice planning, not just on a daily or weekly basis, but for an entire year, uh, you know, where he talked about our first games in February, and then working all the way back to uh, basically, you know, September one and saying, OK, here's how we're going to get ready for that. That's something that I'm sure a lot of coaches don't either have the time or the patience or just didn't really think of that doing it in those terms as opposed to here's what I want to work on today. And then, you know, something you guys did talk about is, is you see what happens in the game and you say, OK, now we need to work on that tomorrow but are you making sure you're incorporating it into a full picture? Sure. So uh, very, very interesting, very good stuff there from coach Anthony Pla. And again, I look forward to maybe after his fall season's over when he has a little bit of uh, free time, we'll get him back in the studio with us again. I think that that would be, that would be great. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow him at coach 
Pla One. That's at Coach Pla P L A, and then the number one at Coach Pla One on Twitter. Uh, go ahead and follow him. He's definitely the type of coach that you'd want to reach out to um, to further your career at the college level. You know, Division Two. There's a limited number of scholarships, but there's a lot of opportunity just to play. And for a lot of kids, that's all that's all that they're looking for. All right, so that'll bring a close to this week's show. Um, again, thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for listening. Please uh, follow, rate, review. You can follow us on Twitter at the CTB Show. On Twitter at the CTB Show. You can email us at clearingthebases at gmail.com. Jimmy and I both have our Twitter uh, addresses out there. We both have Facebook pages. Go ahead and jump on and find us. Uh, thank you guys for listening. and tuning in and always remember the only two things in life that we can control at all times are our effort and our attitude going at, into everything with a positive mental attitude pma put in 100 percent effort good things to follow final thoughts coach yeah everybody out there you know i always want you to remember people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you on the next one